Well, we're back for the final installment of this sermon that Dr. William Charles Robinson preached in 1945. Uh, you'll recall it was a sermon that he prepared uh, during the battle for the bulge, and uh, it was a sermon preached in Warm Springs, Georgia, the Presbyterian Church there, where he would often be called to come and preach. Uh, and on that occasion, President Franklin D. Roosevelt was present. Roosevelt would often attend worship services when in Warm Springs on retreat. And uh, so we've seen the first two points. And Dr. Robinson, Dr. Robbie, as he's remembered by his students who are still living, he said this at the very beginning of point two, God incarnate and Jesus of Nazareth not only suffered our bodily pains, his breast also throbbed with our, broke, our, our heart aches. He who numbers the stars heals the broken in heart. And so in the second point, he talked much about uh, the Lord weeping. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you to myself like a hen gathers her brood, but you would not. And then we have the final point and the conclusion of this sermon that was uh, uh, apparently based on the, the brief letter that Roosevelt wrote to him after returning to Washington, D.C., uh, very uh, important to Roosevelt. And, um, and we trust that uh, perhaps President Roosevelt had tasted the grace of God and seen that it was good and trusted in the Savior. And so we finish with God incarnate for suffering men. The ever-blessed God became incarnate that he might suffer the pangs of our torn flesh. The ever-active creator became a man that he might be susceptible of the creature's fears and tears. But the great gospel paradox is yet to be put. He who has life in himself and who giveth life to whom he will became mortal man that for our sins he might die. He whose years shall not fail became obedient unto death and that the death of the cross. To the dregs he drank our cup of woe that we might quaff his cup of salvation. That he might bring many sons unto glory, he tasted death for every man. Christ both died and rose again that he might be the Lord, both of the dead and of the living. Thus he calls us to go through no darker room than he has gone through before us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, and even death is no new way to thee. With rare literary skill, John Hay, sometimes Secretary of State, portrayed death as the stirrup cup, which the cavalryman used to drink as he mounted his steed. And now he quotes, My short and happy day is done, the long and lonely night comes on, and at my door the pale horse stands to bear me forth to unknown lands. General E.P. Alexander took up the figure and wrote something of his own dauntless daring into it. But storm and gloom and mystery shall only nerve my courage high, who through life's scenes hath borne his part, may face its close with tranquil heart. The lines came into the hands of Reverend James Powers Smith, who as an aide de camp to Stonewall Jackson, had passed through many a valley of the shadow. Dr. Smith put into the figure the tranquil heart that Christ gives. The pale horse stands and will not bide, the night has come, and I must ride, but not alone to unknown lands. My friend goes with me, holding hands. This friend has gone through the straight gate of death, 
his own death before he goes through the gate of death with us. And in that going through of his own death, he drew the sharpest sting out of our death. For the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But Christ died for our sins, the just for the unjust. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Thanks be unto God, who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Compare the death of Jesus with the death of Stephen, and you are immeasurably struck with the contrast. Why should the face of Stephen shine like the face of an angel, while the visage of Jesus was so marred more than any man? Why? Because Jesus, who had no sin of his own, was made sin for Stephen, in order that Stephen, who had no righteousness of his own, might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Because he is the answer for sin, Therefore, Christ has the answer to death. He was delivered for our offenses and raised for our justification. Therefore, in peace, let me resign my breath and thy salvation see. My sins deserved eternal death, but Jesus died for me. It's a proper thought that one draw the veil of charity over the shortcomings of those who die especially of those who die in faith. For the spirits of those who die in the Lord are beautified, made perfect in holiness. And by the grace of the Lord, their spirits are glorified like him who takes them to himself. That noble, fine, generous, loving spirit is changed into his likeness, and all that was base and wicked is done away. Thus we properly think of them as pure and kind, all through, all through like the angelic spirits which surround the throne, all rapture, throw and throw in God's most holy sight. The Christ who pierced the mystery of the tomb rose again from the dead and ascended to the right hand of the Father where he ever liveth to intercede for us. There, his understanding heart, his unceasing prayers, his constant grace, keep our faith from failing and carry onward the church of God until that day when he shall appear a second time apart from sin and the salvation. By tasting death for us, he drew its sting. By rising from the dead and ascending to the right hand of the majesty on high, he has given us an anchor sure and steadfast. Even so them also that sleep in Jesus Christ will God bring with him. At Easter, 1942, the old first church in Birmingham held a memorial service for a lad who went down in the S-26 near Panama. On that occasion, his mother wrote, God has given me a guiding light, a star called faith, that substance of things hoped for, that evidence of things not seen. And now within me peace and joy are born, for some day there shall come a resurrection morn, and I shall see again and know my son. Well, that's the end of this historic sermon preached on Easter Sunday, 1945, in Warm Springs, Georgia, by the last of the stout, orthodox, old-school Presbyterians at Columbia Theological Seminary. I couldn't help but think of the contrast that he drew there near the end of Stephen, as he was on the, on the precipice of death, crossing, as it were, from this life into, into glory, into the presence of the Lord, and his face shone. It shined brightly. Why? Because Christ had already gone through the, the shadow, and he had already passed through the dark veil, and he was standing in heaven, the right hand of the Father, 
and his glorious presence was reflecting in Stephen's face. And as I thought of that, in contrast to the Savior, as he says, there Jesus, who had no sin of his own, was made sin for Stephen, in order that Stephen, who had no righteousness of his own, might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. Our Lord, bleeding, mutilated, pierced, and and under the weight of the wrath of God, on top of all the physical abuse. And, and so we all reap the benefit of that. All that is, we through faith trust in Jesus. Stephen was standing before the crowd and um, and his concern was not so much death. There was no threat from death because what did he have to fear? He was looking forward to being with his Savior. So there was no threat. From the pains of death. Well, may each of us live that way in each day of life, no fear from the threats of death. Because in this world, I suspect, given the trajectory of our wicked, debauched culture in which we live, many of us, some of you younger people more so than some of us who are of age, will face greater fears, greater persecution, greater threats. But because Christ faced the greatest and won, we have nothing to fear. I'm reminded in closing of the book I've told you the story, the covenant folks, of John Davis, the Presbyterian for the PCUS who died in the Amazon jungle of Brazil, ambushed by enemies, interlopers, squatters who would have taken his land from him. And he was asked on multiple occasions living in this in this rather dangerous part of the world at that time, if he was ever afraid. And like the psalmist, his reply, because he walked in the footsteps of Christ, his reply was, afraid? Afraid of what? The psalmist said those same words. What can we be afraid of when we have our Savior, our best friend, by our side. Well, there we are, God incarnate for suffering men. If you'd like to read the entire sermon, it uh, appears in a little volume that I'm sure, sadly, <laughs> I'm sure you can pick up cheaply on the used book market, Christ the Bread of Life, the Peyton Lectures, by William Charles Robinson, Christ the Bread. Or if you'd like, I'll have I'll be happy to make a copy of it and make it available to you. Well, that's for this week. God bless you.